I mean, you're living in your mother's basement writing a blog on finance. Really, you should stay off the computer, son, and get a job. Seriously. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we're looking back at the year that was 2019. What were our favorite moments? No headlines today, no special guests, but lots of moments featuring some of our favorite guests from the year. What did we learn? But it wouldn't be a Stacking Benjamins episode if we left you just with that. Of course, we'll still save time for my amazing trivia. And now, two guys who are dressed like it's mid-1992, Joe and O. J-J-J-J-G. Is that from 1992 as well? Let's do it. Time to party. Welcome back, like everybody. 1997. Well, or 92 or whatever year Doug talked about. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Stacky Benjamin Show, our final full week of the year. Wrapping up. It's the final countdown. Are you excited to have actually a little bit of time off? I am. I got the board games lined up, as you know. Everybody is going to Monopoly be. doesn't count. Stop playing Monopoly 32 times a week and calling it a board game. That did knock it off. You know how I feel about <laughs> That's Monopoly. Such fighting words, isn't you, it? You like are even t- the, the phrase Monopoly, like when they're talking about it in Ooh. the context of like a you know, a trade deal. You're like, Ugh. Do not do not talk about Monopoly. Yeah. Good times on the way. We got a great time today because we are talking about your and our favorite shows of this year, some of the biggest lessons we learned in 2019. By the way, if you want to learn some great lessons, great time to do that here at the end of the year. So big thanks to Skillshare for supporting Stacky Benjamin. Skillshare's offering stackers two months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. You got the whole week coming up next week. Fantastic time to do this. Sign up, go to skillshare.com forward slash SB, two months of unlimited access. We're also brought to you today by Student Loan Hero. Here at the end of the year, Brian at Student Loan Hero tells me that interest rates, pretty low. So if it's time to refinance your student debt, I would first go to Student Loan Hero, read through their resources and see if actually you want to do that or not. Because sometimes you don't want to refinance those student loans. Head to studentloanhero.com for more. We got a great show. We are kicking the headlines to the curb. We actually are going to have eight different guests we're going to hear from today that we heard from earlier in the year. Eight of our favorite episodes from 2019, biggest lessons we learned. So let's, let's get moving. One of my favorite things in 2019 19 OG was some of the historians we've had on and it's amazing how many times with their money people make the same mistake over and over and over and you kind of wish like I wish when I was a financial planner I don't I don't know about you but client privacy sometimes drove me nuts because I'm like oh I need you to sit with these other people so you could learn from the mistake that they made and obviously you couldn't ever do that. But man, learning from history, you can learn so much. Only if you're willing to, though, right? Doesn't it seem like sometimes the benefit of it is the experience? Yeah. No, you know, I, yeah. I kind of say I, I say a little bit tongue in cheek. It's kind of serious. It's kind of tongue in cheek. Like every financial mistake that you could possibly do, I've done twice. The first one I did by mistake and the second time I did just to make sure it was as bad as I thought it was. You know, sometimes it requires you to just be in there, you know, you, can you experience what it's like to be up to your eyeballs in debt without being up to your eyeballs in debt and then getting out of it? I think that's why storytellers are so important because somebody that can tell a good story where they emotionally help you reach that point without you having to go there alone is incredibly valuable. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I would have preferred not to have experienced these things. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) We're going to kick this off today, though, with a guy who learned a huge lesson early in his career. He was pretty cocky. 
he found out that he was getting this inheritance. And uh, this is a story about learning told by Bob Wilson back in August. Bob wrote a book called Barnum. And this is the story of an early lesson from P.T. Barnum. The other part is that his grandfather, when he was born, bought a piece of land in Barnum's name. And he told him it was the most beautiful, productive farm in Connecticut. And that, that Barnum was himself a very rich guy. You know, that, that this farm was so wealthy and it would become his at a certain age. And Barnum says he, you know, he heard so much about it from his grandfather, from his parents, from people in town, that he imagined it to be, you know, a sort of land of milk and honey where there were diamonds in the streams and all this stuff. So this went on, you know, from the time he was, you know, could communicate to till he was about 12 years old and somebody took him out to see his piece of property. And the night before his mother said things to him, like they called him tail tail. I hope you're still going to, you know, talk to us after you've seen this land. You know, I hope you don't feel like you're too good to, to be part of this family. So he goes out and it turns out it's a, He's got to swim through a swamp to get there. He's chased by a snake. He's bitten by hornets. And he sees this island called Ivy Island, which still exists and is still nothing, as what it was, just this completely worthless piece of land. And he realizes then that he's been the victim of this incredible hoax <laughs> that's gone on for years and, with, and in which everyone he knows has participated. <laughs> So, it's funny how P.T. Barnum learns at an early age, OG, that things people tell you might not be exactly the way that you hope they were. You might not be the super rich man. You might have to work kind of hard to get there. Is this the lesson that you should totally lie to your children <laughs> <I know. laughs> from the minute they're born <laughs> and get everyone you know to destroy their hopes? I saw this uh, uh, cartoon strip uh, from Kelvin and Hobbes. You've obviously know Calvin and Hobbes. Some people may not remember them, but um, is this still out? I don't think it is. I don't. I don't think there's any new no. Calvin and Hobbes. Bob now. Watterson stopped a long time ago. Yeah. Anyways, it was uh, Calvin's out shoveling the snow, and he's up to his waist. This was on Twitter a couple of weeks ago. He's up to his waist shoveling. He's yelling back to his dad, "Why can't we just get a snowblower? Everyone has a snowblower. My fingers are freezing." And he, his dad yells back. You're building character. <laughs> and then and Calvin yells back to his dad. Why did every why is it every time I have to build character, it saves you two hundred dollars? The big lesson here, maybe for for Calvin too, but the big lesson here, PT Barnum got to learn at twelve, which was that success isn't handed to you. It's always frustrating to me to see that when we have when we have episodes that have very, we'll call them sexy titles that look like you might get a little something for nothing. I think people might be a little disappointed when they hear those episodes because you would, th th there's no such thing. You look at the people that have been most successful in business in history. They work their butt off to get there. The only shortcut is maybe learning to work smart and, uh, and maybe learning to laugh at yourself. And if you can't laugh at yourself, just make sure you laugh at someone else. <laughs> Take somebody else down. I, I want to fast. <laughs> Just kidding. I want to fast forward a month. We'll come back to history again later because there were three episodes from historians, uh, from biographers that were important in 2019. But I want to get to some career and life advice. When I first heard about the next person we're going to listen to, Colleen Bordeaux, this young woman who had really struggled to figure out life. And then I saw her thin book that I thought looked like, frankly, kind of looked like a cartoony throwaway book. I didn't think a lot about it. And then I opened it and I realized that if I had had some of this life advice, OG, when I was in my 20s, and heck, even now in my 50s, hearing Colleen Bordeaux talk about life with the wisdom of someone well beyond her, her years, uh, this interview really blew me away. And um, and I don't know, I hope we captured it this year, but let's go back and listen for people that missed it. This is a clip from me talking to Colleen Bordeaux back in September about a study 
that was done about people at the end of their life and how they wish their life had gone, you know, really shallow stuff. Yep. The study that you're referencing is by a, a nurse who's named Bronnie Ware. She was an Australian hospice nurse, and she observed thousands of dying patients at the end of their lives and observed that there's a common theme or common thread to those regrets. And she buckets them into top five, the top five regrets, regrets with the number one regret being that I wish I had the courage to live a life true to who I am instead of the life that others expected of me. I mean, reading that book, if you if you read it yourself, it is the saddest concept to think about that you have this kind of one shot and to get to the end and realize that if you had just made a simple change in how you thought, you could have had a very different path. So it was a punch in the gut. Like I'm just reading the introduction to your book and it was like, you hit me right in the stomach (laughs) immediately, (laughs) but don't get me wrong. It's a good thing because, well, you had what you call a quarter life crisis, which kind of was about this very thing. I think, was it about, am I living the life I want to live versus what everybody else wants? Absolutely. I felt that when I graduated college I went from this very predictable, milestone-driven life with consistent feedback loops that I was doing a great job to this abyss in the world where no one is telling you where to go or how to live your life. It's all up to you. I started to realize that I was looking externally at everything that I was supposed to be doing and kind of ending up in a miserable place. So it led me down this wormhole of exploring why that was. And if you look at people who live really fulfilling lives and do things that matter, they all kind of got to this point of looking inside of themselves instead of to the external world to figure out what they're supposed to be doing. This is a very difficult thing, I think, OG, for people to figure out that concept right there. In fact, I was in a uh, Facebook forum this morning Somebody had written on the forum that they had achieved financial independence and somebody had asked them the day they achieved financial independence. They said, so what do you do for work? And the woman said, I don't work. And then proceeded to talk about how weird that was and how empty that it felt. And it's, it's interesting to me, just all the things that are frustrating to me for as somebody who helps so many people get to that point. Cause you see it over and over and over. People think that there's this, there's this brass ring at financial independence. or there's this thing where I'm finally going to feel different, that life is going to be different. And now I'm going to tell all my friends or get this external validation. And when they find out there is no external validation, I feel exactly the same. I'm still inside my head. Everything's the same. There then comes this crisis And it's funny because it transcends money and it's really what life is much more about. Like who cares about how much money you have if your life isn't fulfilling? This is too heavy of a conversation for me this early in the morning. (laughs) Just, just for the record. (laughs) It was a heavy conversation with Colleen. But I think it's just like any goal, whether it's a financial goal or otherwise, you can't get to it and not have the next thing. We were talking about a coaching group that we belong to called Strategic Coach and the idea of always focusing on the horizon and the downside of always like having the next thing is that you forget about how far you've actually come. An interesting exercise as we get toward the end of the year is to think about all of this stuff, draw a timeline from 2010 through 2019 and just start ticking off milestones that happened in your life. Maybe kids were born or maybe you moved across country or maybe you started a podcast or, you know, whatever. And and it's really impressive to look back and consider all of the stuff that's happened because it's really kind of fuel. It gives you fuel anyway for the stuff that could happen over the next 10 years or whatever. But a lot of these folks that you hear about that achieve financial independence or they achieve, you know, the top of the mountain, so to speak, they get real frustrated because they've always had something to look forward to. And now they're there. You have to have the next thing to look forward to. There's a documentary, loosely a documentary on coaching with Bill Belichick and Nick Saban. Oh, wow. Love them or hate them. Those are probably the top two coaches in the entire world. I don't know. Football. Yeah. I think in the entire world, 
I don't know, maybe there's other people, but few people know, and I didn't, that they are really good friends. They've been really good friends for like 40 years, turns out. And they go through that history, but they meet every year to talk shop and kind of hang out and whatever. And apparently this is the only time that any of this has ever been documented. So here's Nick Saban and Bill Belichick. And it's a little scripted, right? Because you sure. know, they've cameras. got cameras and whatever. But some of it isn't scripted. Some of it is they have the microphones on and they, you can kind of tell they've forgotten that they have them on for a second. But the challenge that they talk about very early on is, and I think Nick Saban says this, when you try to get to the top of the mountain and you succeed, then you are the new mountain. And everybody is trying to get to you. And it's very difficult to be at the top and then still go, yeah, we screwed up that last play. We got to do the next thing better. And they show a show an example of him in the first game of this year. They were up 63 to three or something with eight seconds to go. And they're about to commit a penalty. And so he called timeout in the fourth quarter with eight seconds to go ahead by 57 points. And he is ripping into his defense about how they have no class and they have no personal accountability. You know, they got to stay in the game. They, you know, there's still time on the clock. Just giving him a, a, a lesson. Yeah. And it's still and, a teaching moment. So this is true with any financial goal or any goal for that matter. You know, as you work through it, I think it's really important to always have kind of the next thing. Otherwise, eventually you get to the point where you're like, well, I did everything. I'm done. But I think this cuts even deeper than that. That next thing has to be internally motivated. I think what Colleen's talking about is if you're seeking external motivation, you're seeking other people's approval for what you do versus this idea that I made myself happy right? Chasing the horizon goes and goes and goes and you never reach it. You see people that are chasing the horizon. They're always like, damn, I, I'm, I'm never getting anything because I like, you could be Nick Saban and be miserable. And there are times that I think Nick Saban and Bill Belichick are incredibly miserable people. Like you hear them talk and they seem driven. Like, I don't know that I want that. I don't know that I want that. Not, not because I don't want their success, but because when I hear them talk, they always seem to be down in the mouth, not doing enough. I haven't done things right. Like, holy cow, what's... Well, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely a tough balance between recognizing your successes and also recognizing that you can't stop. Because, and this is the problem that you're talking about with clients. When you get to that, if you stop at 65 or you stop at 55... If you stop growing, the opposite of growing is dying. And we've all heard the story of George Burns, who when asked how he lived so long, he said, well, I was, you know, I was booked till I was 100. I had stuff to do. And the moment he stopped being booked is when he kind of started going the other way. You have to be true to yourself. You have to have internal motivation and you have to have internal happiness. And all of that is internal. On the external stuff, you also have to recognize that you have to keep going. And it's, everything is just a journey along the way. Like the, uh, you know, that great book, Mastery, if you remember reading that a long time ago. Yeah. Got to love the plateaus. Do you see the study about uh, Clydesdales? Um, well, I've seen the study with Clydesdales. It's about Budweiser. <laughs> you participated in those studies? <laughs> Many times. And I have a lot of evidence surrounding <laughs> headache my personal stuff. yes uh no about these horses that as long as they're pulling heavy stuff they live and you put them out to pasture they stop pulling heavy stuff and they die it's like yeah. the animals made sense. to pull the heavy stuff i feel like to some degree humans are the same way i mean we are built to do to strive and the second we stop doing that but I still think there's more there. I mean, I think, it, I don't know. I think this idea of seeking other people's approval, you know, hey, I got to financial independence. Look at me. Oh my God, I feel the same. And I'm still empty. And I still haven't thought about what I want to do with my life. I'm yeah, too busy all, looking for everybody. saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else external, is high five. External validation. Well, good news for you, OG. All of our conversations were not that deep. We, we, we had some fantastic light conversations, but still... Great ones in our lead up to Labor Day. We talked to a couple people. We talked to Dave uh, Falchek about good wines. That was a fantastic conversation. But on Monday of that week, Frankie Chalenza, who is a chef and has a fantastic brand called Struggle Meals, 
joined us to talk about one of my favorite topics, food. And we're going to start off with this, OG. We talk about doing and serving, and you wonder how a guy like Frankie got into the business he was in. One of my favorite things is to find out how people got to the point that they are now. We have our stacker of the week in the basement. I always love hearing people's money story. How did you end up here today? And this is how Frankie became a celebrated chef. Okay, so I've got this base of good food. And in college, the school forced us to have a meal plan, but the meal plan was obviously not very good and it was pretty expensive. So I started just cooking burgers and penne pomodoro and people were would you, come over. Were you studying food in college? I, I studied music, business ah. and production. We'll get into that in a second. Anyway, people would come over with five bucks. I'd do the thing. Oh my God, this is so much better than the meal plan. And it turned into this whole thing where people would come over and I'd cook meal and it grew and it grew and it grew till like the seventh person I didn't know who was a friend of a friend was like, you know, you should film this. And that's sort of when I connected the dots. I'm like, I'm studying music, which is performance. I'm studying the production of it, which is all the tech gear behind it. And what if I like swap the guitar and the microphone for a knife and a pan? I know how to video edit. That's going to give me a head start right away. So that's kind of how it started. And then I had to learn how to actually cook. And <laughs> that's something that never ends. But I think I faked it pretty well for the first five years. The last five, I, I... How many times have you heard somebody who's a clear expert at something talk about the fact they're faking it, OG, when you and I know that that's not, that's not true at all. But it's funny, even a guy like Frankie has imposter syndrome, right? I'm faking it. No, he's not. Well, I think we're always faking it at the beginning, right? We're still faking it. Eight years in, we're faking it. Well, we are, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying pros. But I like what he did, these synapses that a lot of people don't think about. He had this interest in music. As he mentioned, that's performance. Now he's going to perform, but he's going to perform something he's always been good at. How about that in college? You know, he's cooking, he's cooking these foods in college you can't get at the cafeteria for friends of his just because he's having fun. Like he took what was fun. He figured out a way to monetize it. And that's not always a good thing to do. But in this case worked out pretty well for Frankie. And I think for a lot of people that are looking at a dead end job, I think a lot of the love of the fire movement is because people hate their jobs and I just want an out. And I sometimes feel bad going back to what we were just talking about with Colleen Bordeaux, people that think I'd rather be doing nothing. No, no, no I think you'd rather be serving, but in a way that feeds your soul. And Frankie was able to find that thing where he now loves what he does and, you know, took tools he already had. I just want some of that pasta he was talking about. I know, right? <laughs> Finding your niche, I think, has been a reoccurring theme over the last eight years. People searching for, how do I get that thing that fits who, who I am? Mm -hmm. Frankie had some other great advice. He talked about dried herbs and we should take all the dried herbs that we have and throw them away. And uh, instead, we should do this. Herbs are a completely different beast altogether. Um, and if you're to swap it out, you're supposed to use just a third the amount of the dried herbs because the flavor is so much more intense. But also, it's just not as good. So an herb garden, which keeps growing, go figure. It's almost like having a dividend stock in a retirement plan. You know, you're only allowed to put a certain amount of money in every year. But these dividend stocks are allowing you to get more than the maximum contribution every year. So here, we, we buy a basil for one ninety nine, but we're going to get more than one ninety nine of basil out of it because it's going to keep growing, right? You like that? I, 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 I have no idea how the hell you just did that. That's I'm in That's, awe. I am not worthy. That was fantastic. Just grow your garden. Grow, do it. I was telling that to your mom upstairs, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Grow your garden. Well, as you know, mom's got the garden with all that stuff. But that's that's on my 2020 list now, OG. Grow those herbs. Uh, I think it's herb. Make, make, grow herb. Uh, make your make, – make your, You're going to grow some herbs, aren't you? Especially in Michigan now because it's legal. Not not growing any of that those herbs. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, no heat lamps. But, <sighs> but next year, the basil – You've got a big greenhouse out back. You're like, I can grow a lot of – Herbs in my herb garden. Yeah, uh, basil. It's it's yeah. in a state forest, but if if you seen an episode of Moonshiners, it's kind of like that. <laughs> but only with herbs. I'm killing it with the basil crop these days. I love this idea of having an herb garden. Something 
A, that's fun. B, is a side activity that is, gets your head out of whatever your main gig is. You know, gardening, you really got to be in the moment. And uh, it's like a dividend stock. That is actually a really good analogy. We, we, we do a lot of basil in our house. So we do have a basil plant and it's kind of, it's just like you said, that thing never stops growing. So it's cool. I want to go back to history for just a moment because we had a great interview early in the year with a gentleman named Neil Bond who worked directly for one of the biggest icons in investing T. Rowe Price. And this is Neil Bond talking about T. Rowe Price and how he came up with his growth investment strategy that was iconic at the time and still in the face of all the indexing going on today, still works. Can you tell me a little bit about how those funds were developed initially? Uh, Mr. Price developed what he called the growth stock philosophy. And basically it was due to his being at DuPont uh, where he learned that The way to make money was not to trade it. The DuPonts made their fortunes from holding through thick and thin shares of common shares of DuPont. Similarly, his friends who worked at DuPont, the ones that made the money were the ones that held DuPont. DuPont was a rapidly growing company at that point in time, growing faster than the economy. And as he looked at DuPont, he developed his growth stock philosophy along what made DuPont successful, i.e. a great management, one of the best in the world fantastic finances in an industry that was growing far faster than the economy in a company whose sales were growing far faster than the economy. And he focused on one particular financial detail that actually was very important to DuPont's success, which is return on invested capital. In those days, people just looked at profit margin, but obviously return on invested capital is the key to the success of any business. So he put those into a format called the growth stock philosophy, which I describe in some detail in the book and uh, use this to start the growth stock fund, which only invested in growth stocks. The purpose was to analyze companies, not stocks. He didn't feel that trading stocks, as I pointed out in my DuPont example, made any sense. He said he'd never known anybody that made money consistently on trading stocks. But focusing on companies is much more of a common sense approach to investing. What I liked about this, too, was the fact that he knew this from firsthand experience. Yes. He had done (laughs) short-term trading at one point. So he knew in his bones that it didn't work. Very good point, Joe. He he did. And uh, the growth stock fund in its first 10 years was the best performing fund in its uh, category, which was the large companies in those days. And he started his, what you mentioned, his second fund, the New Horizons Fund, in 1960, 10 years after he started the Growth Stock Fund. And the New Horizons Fund became the best performing fund, mutual fund, in the United States. He had done short-term trading. It's funny. I remember, I think it's Tony Robbins who said, you hear one or two gurus say something, it might be their little thing, their shtick. But you hear it over and over and over from people. And it's the truth. And when you hear Warren Buffett talk about what's his perfect holding time on a stock forever. And then you hear T Rowe price who done short-term trading early in his career instead talk about looking at not stocks, but looking at companies if he's buying individual stocks and diving down into the company and holding that, that good company, huge, huge lesson. I think for a lot of investors. Well, it wasn't a popular thing then. It's not popular now. What we've decided to do as an investing public is to get rid of those people, right? And trade them out for ourselves. So we used to have portfolio managers who did all of that research, who would look out and say, I've looked through this company and I've read the performance reports or the, the quarterly reports and the annual reports. And I've talked to the board of directors and I've been on the plant floor and I've seen the operation and things like that. And we traded that away for, I'm going to buy one of everything, which is fine, by the way. That's the index fund thing. But we don't do that as individual investors anymore. Every person that I talk to about individual stock investing has a very similar refrain, which is, we talked about it at dinner the other day and it sounded like a good thing. Or I really like the design of the new Tesla truck, so I'm sure they're going to sell a lot of them. 
without paying any attention to the actual profit margins or the cash flow or, or like, re- return on invested or capital. Return on invested capital. So we have traded away as an investing public people who do that, portfolio managers, and turned ourselves into portfolio managers. Although, to be fair, most of us don't do a very good job at that. And so we take these other tools now that we use and we trade the heck out of those also. Not our listeners, of course, because our listeners are long-term buy and hold people who never make emotional decisions with money. But the vast investing public does. So I think it was an unpopular opinion back then and I think it's an unpopular opinion now. But if you can manage to buy a good investment and then don't freaking touch it ever again using... Frankie's example of it continues to grow more basil, right? right. More than a dollar ninety nine worth of basil. Like you don't rip the basil plant out. You just take a little bit here and there. And you will never run out. But what we like to do as the investing public is rip it out of the ground and go, Yeah, I don't think this ground is good anymore. I'm gonna go move it to a different part. I think it grows better over there. I think it grows better yeah. over there. And and all you do when you keep moving the plant every three weeks, you kill the plant. Said better than I could. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Hey, those are four of our favorites, but my three most favorite we're going to do here. Mostest favorite tist. Be most favorite tist. So we're going to go refill our coffee here because Doug tells me, oh, gee, he's got some phenomenal, phenomenal trivia today. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and are you just loving this walk down 2019 memory lane as much as me? I'll add to it with today's trivia question. On March 10th, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302, a plane bound for Nairobi, crashes shortly after takeoff, killing all 150 people on board. What was the name of the plane that was grounded worldwide after the crash? I'll be back with the answer in just a moment. What's the most fun thing for us to do this year? What's the present we like unwrapping? We like the gift of more knowledge. And that's why we'd like to say a big thanks to Skillshare for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators, no matter what you create, whether you're trying to create a budget for yourself or better financial plan, or maybe you're trying to do design like we are, whatever it might be, Skillshare has it for you. There's more than 25,000 classes in all, and it's all over the place from creating your budget, the six areas of financial planning. We've done courses in social media marketing, creative writing, even illustration. Whether you're looking to discover something new this time of year, start a side hustle with maybe some time off your number one job or to gain new professional skills, Skillshare is there to keep you learning, thriving and reaching New Year's goals. Next class for us, I think I'm diving into Photography 201 now. It was last January and February that I really went heavy into the uh, 101 photography. And I'm looking at the camera here and I'm thinking, I'd like to get back out there, take some more shots. It's so fun, especially since I'm going to have the opportunity, OG, soon to talk about my trip to Japan. And I know that you're super excited about the fact that I'm going to go on and on and on about that. Join millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for stackers. Get two months of Skillshare for free. That's right. Skillshare is offering Stacky Benjamin stackers two months of unlimited access to over 25,000 classes for free to sign up. Head to Skillshare.com slash SB. Again, that's Skillshare.com slash SB to start your two months now. That's Skillshare.com slash SB. I'm also super excited this time of year when you have extra time. Like, is that really a thing this time of year? I think it's the only time when I feel like I have extra time these days, but that's when, if you've got student loans, you head to studentloanhero.com. Or if you're deciding, you know what I really need, not just Skillshare level classes. I need 
to really develop a stronger ROI. And before you go into any student loan debt, head to studentloanhero.com so you can get your custom repayment plan today and also see how Student Loan Hero can help you lower interest rates, decrease monthly payments, and find forgiveness. Our friend Brian, who's going to be on the show, he not only heads up Student Loan Hero, but also Magnify Money. He's going to help us with a debt cleanse for those of you that messed up this month. He'll be tackling that with us. But on a phone call a couple of weeks ago, Brian told me interest rates on student loans have followed what the Fed has done. As the Fed lowered rates, you've seen student loan interest rates drop as well. So whether you're refinancing your loan, you'll want to read about the six best banks to refinance and consolidate student loans with, or the 10 essential things to ask before refinancing your student loans. Or if you're looking for lower payments, you can learn about income-based repayments, the ultimate guide to lowering your student loan payments. It's all there. Even forgiveness, public service loan forgiveness, whether you qualify parent plus loan forgiveness, here's how to get that. All those things and more at studentloanhero.com. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, back with some significant trivia from 2019. It was a horrible year for the families of many people aboard an aircraft and one that on March 10th crashed shortly after takeoff. Here was the question. What was the name of the plane that was grounded worldwide after the crash? If you said a Boeing 737 MAX, you'd be correct. Well, that's some important trivia from 2019. I think I prefer Joe and OG's march through the year. So back to you, fellas. Boy, that's a horrible story, OG, about tragedy. It's a horrible business story. It's a horrible, just just the whole Boeing 737 MAX issue this year. I think a clearly defining moment of 2019 that um, from every angle was just, uh, <laughs> what do you say? Not good. Not good is probably the the worst phrase you could use for that. I just read that there's still more stuff coming out of that, like, the companies who are using or use those planes. Now I'm not talking about the ones that were in the accidents, but the uh, like Southwest just got a settlement from Boeing because of all the lost money that, you know, that they've had to experience because of the um, planes being out of service. Just absolutely painful. Uh, let's get back into happier ground. I love focusing on the other side of the equation. A lot of times we spend our time in finance talking about, after we earn money, what to do with that cash. I love the idea of how to make more money and how to also find more meaning in our work since we spend so much time doing it. What if we made it more meaningful? And for that, we talked to Ashley Goodall in one of the most riveting discussions about the world of work. Here, he and I are talking about some of the lies in the world of work. Yeah, we were uh, talking about feedback, which is one of the things we talk about in the book. And probably also another one of these things that makes our shoulders sag a little bit. If I say to you, hey, Joe, I've just been chatting to your mom uh, upstairs. And I, boy, have I got some feedback for you. Oh, good. Then there's a little part of your brain that wants to exit the basement as fast as possible and get as far away from me as possible, as quickly as possible. And that's a problem. Because in the world of work, we think that giving people constructive, critical feedback is our most important tool to help them do better at work. And again, you look at the evidence, just ain't so. When it comes to feedback, and this wasn't one that I wanted to cover, but while we're on that, I always think, and am I like the average person? I always think, if you tell me you want to give me feedback, I'm going to completely ignore the first thing you say, because that's supposed to soften me up. I'm going to listen probably too intensely to the second thing you say. And then I'm going to uh, completely forget the third thing that you say to try to lighten it up again. Because you're in a traumatic shock because of the second thing I said, right? Because right, right. you, what you're saying is that's the, there's a name for this thing. It's called the feedback sandwich, which is a sort of coining that says, oh, this stuff is so unpleasant that we've got to surround it with <laughs> lots of goodness. And somehow if I, I can trick you into listening to the bit in the middle, um, the real problem with that is that when you get to the bit in the middle and you're trying to listen, but really it's an unpleasant experience. So firstly, your brain isn't primed for learning. And secondly, the content of the bit in the middle is generally about something that you did wrong or badly, according to me, by the way, and I'm not the authority on you. 
So I'm saying you did this wrong. The sadness of the whole thing is that what that means is critical feedback, constructive feedback is a mistake fixing tool. But you can't use a mistake fixing tool as an excellence making tool because they're completely different things. If I want to help you be great, the raw ingredient of great performance is actually performance that's already good. So what I need to do to help you grow is to say, hey, that thing you just did, that was great. What was going on in your head? What were you thinking? Where, where could you use that more? How can I reflect to you my experience of something that you did that's beautiful and well done and, and, and the potential of something much greater? And how can I help you figure out how you can build on it? Now, you know, every time we say that, people come back and go, yes, but isn't mistake fixing? Are you saying we shouldn't fix mistakes? And of course, the answer is no, we need to fix mistakes. But we shouldn't delude ourselves into thinking that by the time we've fixed every mistake in our organizations, we've created anything that's fine and strong and excellent. I love that idea. And I'm going to swing back to the coaches that you and I have, the people at Strategic Coach OG, because the one big aha that I think more people need is spend less time trying to take the stuff that you're incompetent at and making it competent and instead spend more time finding those things that you're good at, like Ashley saying here and making them great. If you're really trying to get to excellence, don't spend your time trying to be mediocre at stuff, delegate away the mediocre stuff and focus on honing those things that you really rock at. I love what he said there. And I think it also applies to what we first started talking about at the very beginning, which was, you know, usefulness and having something that you're internally excited about and working in the thing that you are really enjoying. You know, not all of us are entrepreneurs and we can't go out and hire somebody tomorrow and say, well, I don't want to do this anymore. So I'm going to hire somebody to do it for me. But we do have the opportunity to look for a more aligned role relative to the things that we are, we are really, really, really good at. My favorite phrase about this stuff is if you spend your whole lifetime getting better at your weaknesses, you end up with a whole bunch of mediocre weaknesses yeah. at the end of your life. Yeah. This is really informed like how I work with my kids and things like that on like homework and stuff like that. Like, you know, I, I got a seventh grader and a fifth grader. I, I got an idea of like what they're good at. Like we can teach the other stuff, but I don't expect them to like all of a sudden go from being really great math people to being really great English language or, people, yeah. for example, you know, whatever. And so we will spend a lot of our time on more trying to do more advanced stuff in the things that they're really good at and then just making sure they're competent in the other stuff, right? I'm not going to raise a bunch of kids that can't spell, but if that's not their thing, I'm also going to be okay with the fact that they just might get a B in it and I'm okay with the B. I prefer A's, but you better get an A plus in the thing that you're in science because that's the thing you love and that's the thing you're really good at. So you don't get to slack on that because it comes natural or it's super easy. But I think that more people, as I would say, if, if you spent more time getting stronger at the thing that you're really good at, you'll be world class at that really strong thing. There's something else there too, which is not only are you world class at it, I think it's more fun. Like a, an exercise we did this last week was, you know, write with, if unless you're ambidextrous, write with your, your name with your main hand. Now try to write it with your other hand. Like not only does it suck, it looks horrible. It's painful even trying to do it. Yeah. Like spend more of your life trying to write with your dominant hand. Spend less of your life oh, trying, to write, yeah. trying to write with the other one. Well, I wish I came up with it. But that's, again... <laughs> given a lot of strategic coach love today because I just got back from my coaching class. And our affiliate code, you That's might find right. out, is stackingbenjamins.com. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should have one. Right. Let's get back into our top moments of 2019. Here's a quirky one where we learned a lot about money and managing money well. We talked to Doug Lynham about his journey from being a monk to a money manager. But now as a financial advisor, I can show you how money is a very important and critical tool for living those values. Well, and I like how you kind of draw this juxtaposition between the monks aren't talking about money. And then later in the book, you talk about how to have a great money conversation about. Yeah. And, and I love some of the ideas like do it in public so you can't kind of storm off. Right. 
I felt that was a little Jerry Maguire ish, where they, where, where, they, where they fire for people that haven't seen Jerry Maguire. He gets fired in a public place so that he can't raise a stink and raise his voice or anything. I felt the same thing with 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 your with your idea here, but I thought it was great. <laughs> but but it What's all true? revolves around these discussions, right? Because they're hard. I mean, they're hard. You're gonna step on people's toes emotionally, and you're gonna poke holes in their egos. And there's always going to be if, – if there's a money crisis in your household, right, there's going to be guilt. There's going to be shame. There's going to be recriminations. And you got to find a way to get past all that to solutions because it's the solutions that matter. And if all you're doing – which I was guilty of this. I'm not exempting myself from the, these problems. The monastery's problems were my problems. I made them happen as much as anybody else through my neglect and my unwillingness to take responsibility for this stuff. Now, eventually, I did step up to it, but but it took a while and took a lot of hard knocks. And so, when you're having those hard money conversations, you really need to be strategic. And, and- you really do got to be strategic, OG. And not only that, you also have to be able to not make the other person feel bad. Because to Doug's point, you're having these difficult conversations when your money sucked for so long that there's going to be a lot of guilt, a lot of finger pointing, a lot of anger. It's, but you got to get it started. I think it's really important to recognize that it is what it really is. And you can see things how they are, but you can't see things worse than they are. And you can't see things better than they are. And if you go into the fix, let's call it, with your partner, business partner, uh, life partner, whatever, even with yourself, by the way, if you're doing this on your own, sometimes you'll thumb through your investment statements or thumb through your credit card statements and go, I'm an idiot. I shouldn't have done that. Don't say that stuff. You know, the mental imagery that that creates is really bad. It just, you are where you are. And it's all about what sort of decisions can we make today and moving forward that will affect different outcomes from where we are today, passing no judgment on how we got to this point. And if you can believe that, that you don't, you're not going to pass any judgment. You, it is what it is. We are where we are. Let's figure out how to move forward in the most strategic way with the cards that we're dealt. Maybe we're $100,000 in credit card debt and we just lost a job and maybe we shouldn't have gone on vacation last month. You can't undo that. It just, you, how do we move forward? And if you can do that very calmly, the outcome is so much better. You know, your brain is super powerful. If you ask it really good questions, I got this from Tony Robbins. You were talking about Tony Robbins before. If you ask yourself really good questions, you get really good answers. If you ask yourself really stupid questions, you generally get really stupid answers. Like, oh, why am I such a dummy? Why do I suck so bad with money? And your brain's like, well, it's because you're stupid. If you say, okay, how can I solve this? Your brain and the brains of the people around you, uh, if you're involving other people, will come up with a really great solution. Well, I also like uh, something that you and I both have learned at our coaching sessions, which is that your brain also is incredibly smart if you ask it the right questions and it will come up with all kinds of very valid roadblocks why you can't. And you need to write all those things down that you ca- that are the reasons why you can't and then look at those and your brain will figure out a way to solve every single one of them. It was amazing when yeah. my coach took me through all that. I went through all these reasons why I couldn't do this task I was working on, wrote them all down, got them all out, and they were all valid. They were all important. And I could solve every damn one of them. Yeah, because it's all solvable. It was, Everything is solvable. It was it was crazy. Uh, we're going to go from one incredibly creative conversation. By the way, if you get a chance to go to our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com, you will see the links to all of these original shows if you want to hear them in depth. That one with Doug Lynham, the fact that they figured out the monastery was in trouble when the sofa broke while they were watching television together in the monastery and they had to go get a new one and nobody had any money. And they realized that they were pretty damn close to bankrupt. (laughs) Like the the whole story, the whole story of how that went down is uh, well worth your time. Another thing well worth your time is a guy who I've talked about a lot here on the show. We were so happy we were able to have him back in 2019. Austin Cleon, has written some phenomenal books that have changed the way that I think about business, the way that I think about this show and creating the show. Uh, Frankly, the way we created the show is a lot around the same philosophies Austin Kleon has. Uh, His first book was called steel like an artist. His last book though is called keep going. And he talks about the fact that we're in a society OG 
that is so distracted. We're always distracted. We're playing on our phones. We got other thoughts that come up. Oh, geez, What's that? Oh, geez, playing with this phone right now. I am. Uh, it's awesome. And this is Austin Cleon and I talking about getting something done in this world full of distractions. You always have this little black rectangle that you carry around and it it's constantly vibrating and <laughs> sending you messages and stuff. And you can be connected at any point that you want to be. The real fight now as a creative person is to get disconnected long enough to figure out what it is that you have to say and do something about it to actually make work. I high five myself when I when I read you saying life in airplane mode, not a bad thing. Yeah. Airplane mode can be a way of life. I love taking a thing like airplane mode on your phone and, and thinking about it kind of concretely. There's an artist who I love named Nina Kachadorian, and she has this art series called Seat Assignment, where every time she gets on a long flight, she gives herself an art assignment where she has to make a piece of art using nothing but what she packed, what's on the airplane, and her mobile phone. And she's been doing this since, I think, 2010, maybe. She's been doing this for a really long time. And she comes up with these wonderful things. She makes these really interesting images out of, like, in-flight magazines and she folds her sweater up into these gorilla faces, and then she goes in the lavatory and makes these fake duck, Dutch portraits using toilet paper. It's, it's really fun and really funny. And what I love about it is that she's figured out a way to use her phone for good, you know, like because she's using her mobile phone to make this art, but it's in airplane mode, and she's literally on an airplane and like that's how she's figured out a way to churn out work. And I think we can all figure out how we can be in airplane mode. You know, it's not. I love that life in airplane mode. I think so, that's why it's always so hard to text you because your phone's always in airplane mode. I, I have to be. You know me well enough. I have ADD super bad. If I'm not in airplane mode, nothing gets done. Nothing. Nothing gets done. And and he talks about creative people. And I push back on him later in the interview that to some degree, OG, we all have to be creative and to get anything done, to be present in the moment, right? To live a more fulfilling life, we have to be where we are. And that little black rectangle that Austin talks about, by the way, I could listen to his voice forever. Just the, the quality by which he talks is is pretty amazingly quirky. Being in airplane mode allows this woman to create Dutch portraits out of toilet paper in a lavatory and we don't all have to be doing that but this idea of airplane mode i think is fantastic i went to a uh, uh event our school had for the parents kind of like a talk to the headmaster type session and surprisingly not well attended one of the things that he was talking about was because of the generation that our kids are in which is the only generation so far to always have access to everything all the time. Of course, our generation was the middle ground, right? We had encyclopedias that we had to look stuff up on, right? you know, and you could buy the set if you got enough groceries at the supermarket, you know, you could, you could get, do you remember that? Yes. Did your mom ever do that? Like, oh, we have to go shopping today. If we spend enough money that we can get the encyclopedia set or something, you know, or you had to go to the library to get a book. I was in my hometown the other day and the library, it doesn't even exist anymore. It's not the building no longer exists. Isn't it sad? It's crazy. Our local library here is beautiful and is huge. And uh, since the time we've moved, they've rearranged stuff. And there is a huge area of the library now that is empty because there's no need for these these books. Yeah. So what Chris was talking about to us was, you know, you have all of this stuff all of the time. It's almost the other way around. We used to, when we were kids, go somewhere sometimes for entertainment, right? We'd go to the movies or we'd go out to dinner or we'd go and that would be our kind of escape, if you will. And now we have to do the exact opposite. We have to actually detach from all of that stuff in order to escape from it. If that makes sense, yeah. which is kind of a weird way to do it. Next time you go out to eat, look around the restaurant. And it's so funny. Like people are just shoveling food in their mouth, staring at their iPhones. You know, they've got a whole table full of people 
<laughs> there's four, three other people at the table and every one of them is just staring at their iPhone, like shoveling food. It's like not a single word, more, more water. <laughs> you know, it's just, <laughs> it's really kind of interesting. So you got to have to set some rules in place for yourself like that. I think. And seriously, what's the sense of having more money if you're not, present with you can it. You have a faster iPhone. Yeah, present. You can have like 11 Pro Max <laughs> S to 5,000. I was thinking about that yesterday on my Xbox. I actually got a rare moment at the end of the day. I was fried. Went and turned on my Xbox. That's not rare. And I thought, I thought these load screens are horrible. I need... Wait, the new Xbox is coming. I know. Well, that's why I'm not going to get it. But, but I thought I need that new hard drive, the Seagate hard drive that you can get with it that, that loads everything faster. More now. Give it a second. It's going into outer space. I know. Austin, be like, are you kidding me? You can just relax for a second while you watch the wheel spin. Close your eyes. Yes. But I want to get to my next golf Meditate. match quicker. That's what I want. It was so fun. More now. Faster. Better. Take a breath. Well, speaking of taking a breath, I love on the show, those moments when we can learn from people that are in industries that people don't think about when they think money. We played Frankie Chalenza earlier. Uh, of course, Austin Cleon just talking about art. Uh, one specific type of art, Robert Mann for a long time was the creator and the head of the Juilliard Quartet. He also had a long and distinguished career. His son, Nicholas Mann, is not only a conductor and a composer as well, he also spent some time with me talking about his dad's autobiography he wrote just before he died, about a year and a half ago. Uh, this is Nicholas Mann talking about the importance, kind of OG, of uh, making friends. And it's a little bit about who you know and also being an expert in your area of whatever you've decided to devote your life to. Here's Nicholas Mann talking about his father, Robert Mann. Your dad, around World War II, was fairly certain he was going to get drafted, and he did. Tell me about that time frame. Yeah, well, in those days, you had no choice. Because he was a, a musician, he got himself – first, the, the great story is he – so he has to go into, you know, the six weeks of intensive drilling, you know, uh, boot camp. He smuggles his violin in, which is a no-no, and they discover it, like, on the third day or second day, and he gets – yelled, you come down to the sergeant's quarters and bring your violin. And they're there with a couple of the, the captains and the various people. And the guy says, do you play that there thing? And he said, yeah. And the guy says, do you know the bumblebee? And it just so happened my father learned the, the flight of the bumblebee and one other famous local, you know, popular song of the day. And he said, yeah, I know it. And the guy says, well, the world's record on a guitar is 54 seconds. We're going to time you. So the guy, the sergeant takes out his stopwatch. My father has to start playing. He plays as fast as he can, finishes, and the sergeant says, hey, you're only two seconds slower than the world record. And so they thought that was pretty good. And so they, they gave him like the day off doing menial tasks instead of hard work. What my father didn't tell him is he cheated. And there's about eight bars that you have to repeat in the, in the piece. He didn't take the repeat. So he consequently, he almost had the world record. <laughs> Another lucky fool or drunkard moment. It's so great. And so very smart. Well, and later on too, knowing friends in high places really helped his career. His gift of music uh, kept him out of the Pacific. I understand. Right. They put him in a jazz band with two other people. And basically he didn't have to go to, to any of the battle into the war front. He was stayed in, in the U.S. on a little island. It was supposedly the lookout for the U-boats, but basically his job was to entertain the, the officers. And as your dad writes in his memoir, while the general runs the uh, – was it the general or the colonel runs the military, uh, his wife runs him – and every time he was on a sheet to ship out, she got his name off of that. <laughs> well, I guess I guess they liked his playing. They liked it, the, the entertainment they got from. The General's wife loved the fact that uh, Robert Mann could play music and kept him alive. Oh, gee. His gift of music, which I think a lot of us take music for granted, kept him out of the Pacific. It's um, another great example of strengthening all your strengths, doing your thing that you're really good at. Holy cow. 
what a moment in American history. And um, <laughs> I thought on a much lighter note, him, 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 him cheating to almost get the get the world record. Brilliant. Yeah, no one would know. I wouldn't know. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and and that's why being very good at what you're good at. But to your point, a lot of times, OG, we focus on that one thing that we stink at or that we're bad at. And I remember being told when I first became a public speaker that the only person that doesn't know the part of the script that you forgot is you. When you forget something, when you don't do something, when you whatever. So then you have a choice. Do I go back and get it? Or is it not worth going back and getting it? And we don't know if Robert Mann really meant to cheat or not. Maybe he was so nervous he just forgot to do it. And they said, oh, you almost broke the world record. Of course, in his head, he's going, how the hell did I almost break the world? <laughs> oh, I didn't repeat that one part. Oh, yeah. It could have right. been that. But nobody sure. knows the piece that you don't know, that you didn't do. They only know you by what you did, what you showed up with. And um, I think we spend a lot of time focusing on the negative, right? We talked about that earlier in the show, thinking about the horizon and what we still have to do instead of giving ourselves a little credit for, hey, I actually know Flight of the Bumblebee. I could show up with my violin and actually do this thing. Right, right, yep. I want to end this with my favorite interview of 2019, you know, to some degree, I think the fire movement speaks to all of us, uh, the fact this quest to do more and better and optimization, but it doesn't 100% sense speak to me personally and couldn't really figure out why until I talked to this gentleman. Ken Honda was on the show this year around the middle of the year. He wrote a book called Happy Money. I'm going to play a little clip of Ken Honda talking. And a lot of this is the same stuff that a lot of our friends in the fire movement talk about. But this resonated with me very, very, very deeply. In fact, our mutual friend, OG Paula, and I had a two-hour conversation about it. You and I talked about this, about happy money for a good long time. That There has been no interview I did this year which prompted more conversations about money and the way you live your life uh, for me than, than my interview with Ken Honda. And here's a little clip of that. One big concept that you have in the book, you have financial IQ and EQ. And I think these are really yes. important for our listeners to understand uh -huh. your concepts. Can you explain the right. difference between those two? Financial IQ is something of the, a lot of teachers and the consultants deal. It's about taxes, marketing, how to uh, run business. It's a, a knowledge side. And money EQ is more of a wisdom side. It's an emotional side. You know, you have to be able to receive well. We are so good at giving, but we are suck at uh, receiving. So, and also appreciating is another key. Uh, we forget to appreciate in our life in general about our money, about the job, about the family members, about the people who work with. And number three is a trust. Trust in money or trust in money flow is the hardest thing in life. And the last one is uh, share. Sharing is the most beautiful thing you can do on this planet. And you, you don't have to be super wealthy. You can share a dollar with somebody. And then that gives you joy and also sends a message to you that you have more than enough. And this feeling of having more than enough gives you so, peace, uh, so much peace and security. And so instead of accumulating wealth, you have to find or seek happiness and security and peace in yourself. That's what I teach. I absolutely love that concept. This idea of an abundance mindset, OG, versus a scarcity mindset. Instead of more for me, I have more than enough for me, and I have enough that I can give. And I think this idea of abundance and giving and taking care of other people. And if I take care of other people, then I will always be taken care of. When he talks about appreciating and trust and the fact that we suck at receiving, just a phenomenal message, I think, to leave the year on. I love the part where he is talking about it sends a signal to your brain that there's more than enough. And that's really so true because a lot of the restrictions that we have when it comes to money or you know, we were talking about relationships and relationships, money and all that sort of stuff. 
it's all of that, you know, six inches between your ears. That's the restriction. You've already taken your income and your net worth and doubled it. There was a time where you had half as much as you have today. So you already have the map on how to do that. You can do that again, but you get to the point where you're like, oh, well, now I make 100 grand. There's no way I can go get a job that makes 200,000. Well, yeah, but you remember when you were in college and you made 20, not even probably 12 <laughs> bucks an hour, eight bucks an hour, and you went, it'd be great if I could make 30 grand. If I could only. Or I could make 50. If I could only make 80. If I could only make 100, and here you are. Or you're saving 10% of your income. And it's like, well, yeah, there's no way I could save 15. There's no way I could save 20. Well, again, back to that discussion that you have in your brain, your brain will be like, yeah, you're right. Better not do it because it wants you to be right. You are the most trustworthy person you know. You can't lie to yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. So your brain won't let you, you know? So if you say you can't do it, you can't. What's that saying? Whether you whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're, you're right. probably right. Yeah. You know? So when you do things like have a charitable intent and whether that's in the sense of, you know, I'll host dinner or I'll pick up the tab or I'm going to donate money to my thing that I care about or time or whatever it is, you're positioning your psyche, so to speak, that says, I'm good. Everything that we do, I always find that you can tell the people that are, you know, struggling. You know what I mean? Like you can tell the person that's like, you better buy this car from me today because I got to put food on the table. And that sends a signal to other people. Whereas when you have this, this mentality of there's more than enough and I will be safe and I will be secure in what I have, um, then that universe of stuff, it just expands even more. It's really, it's really kind of very philosophical, I suppose, but I've seen many examples of that. And my personal life and business and you, see, you have and you see many examples, but they're still rare enough that you see them clearly when they happen. It is, yeah. it is not the rule. It's the exception, but it's the exception enough. There's enough people that get this, that you can point to them and go, Oh, that, that mm -hmm. just a fantastic model. And what a great way to, to end 2019 and head into, into a new decade, thinking about appreciating, trusting and uh, sharing. That's going to do it for today, everybody. Uh, thanks for hanging out. By the way, all of these interviews, all of these resources on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com if you want to go listen to uh, those interviews in full. We spent a good uh, 20 or 25 minutes with each of these people. Coming up the rest of the year, just to round this, this out, on Friday, we're going to talk with Len, Paula, and special guest Doc G from the What's Up Next podcast about their biggest lessons from the last decade. So you'll get their perspective as well on Friday. And then on Monday, OG and I are back with celebrity guest Liz Weston. OG coming down to the basement. You've read Liz's books. She's one of the top names in personal finance. And this year, she's going to help us talk about what should we have learned from the events of 2019. Then to close out the year, as OG and I take a little bit of time off, we're going to come the last seven days of the year and we're going to introduce episodes. Uh, we're giving the fin turn the last few days of the decade off and OG and I are going to tee up our episodes year by year of the last six years of the decade. So we usually have episodes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, not so the last week of the year. We're going to have episodes every stinking day, OG, as people hear our takeaways from six years ago, five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, last year, and then a very, very special Rewind episode for New Year's Day. Another one of our favorite guests from past years, but somebody who's uh, going to help us roll into 2020 with some better stuff. And I'm going to leave that one. As it is for those of you looking for new financial help in your corner, OG and his team are taking clients head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG for more on uh, how you can interface with him and his team. Get on their waiting list for 2020 last. Thanks to everybody who's left us a review of, of the show or who's written me personally after my diatribe last week, I had some fantastic notes from people. And we don't take it lightly 
that you spend one of your most valuable resources with us, your time. So thanks to everybody who's done that. And just one, uh, well, this is the one that mom has on her refrigerator today. This is SB Haiku. Done any haiku Ooh, lately? I have not. <laughs> this it's was been a long time since I've been in fourth grade. This is we thought we thought uh, we thought that Austin Cleon was creative. This is incredibly creative. Fourth grade, come on, you could do haiku right now. Haiku's fun for all ages. Financial planning, Joe and OG make it fun. Doug adds special sauce. Nice. There it is. Nice work. We'll leave it there, guys. We'll see you back here on Friday. Go stacks and Benjamins. Mr. Doug, it's all yours now. Take it away. Jeez, where do I start on all the takeaways from today? Uh, first, I think, take some advice from Ken Honda. Want to have a great life? Serve others, and you'll be richly rewarded. Second, take some advice from T. Rowe Price. Want to be a better investor? Keep fees low and look for better opportunities. But the big lesson? Don't share with Joe's mom your biggest moments of 2019 unless you're also prepared to tell her that the pie she made on June 23rd was the best pie you've ever had. Trust me, just just, just run with it. You won't regret it. Promise. Special thanks to all of you for hanging out with us this year. Wasn't that a great walk down memory lane? If you'd like to hear the whole interviews of any of the fine people Joe and OG discussed today, head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjaminsCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I swear the worst part about coming over to Joe's mom's house is having to put on pants. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. What are you still doing here? The show is over. Go home. I don't know who started this trend, but I'm just going to leave this here with Star Wars opening this weekend. Midnight showings in a lot of places tomorrow night. I'm going at six o'clock tomorrow night. Are you? Yeah, dude. Does it start with uh, with like older episodes and kind of leads into it or it's just no, six it's o'clock? Straight up six o'clock. Yeah. Wow. Here we go. Well, you're going to appreciate this then. Big credit goes to by how it should have ended YouTube channel for that one. I'm excited. Have fun, man. See ya.